The topic for this presentation is the need for using an active medium with three or more energy levels for a lasing operation. Just a quick reminder of what we want in a laser. We want high monochromaticity, high temporal coherence, and high spatial coherence. And what a laser does is that it amplifies the light, and this amplification is done by the lasing medium. Now, in order to understand how this amplification occurs, we need to understand what happens when the photons that we feed to the medium interact with the medium. So these are the three processes occurring inside the lasing medium, that is absorption, spontaneous emission, and stimulated emission. And I believe that we're all familiar with these processes. So let's assume that there are many atoms inside a cavity, which in this case is our lasing medium. And now some of these atoms will be in the ground state, and some of them will be in the excited state. So when we shine a photon onto this cavity, and if the frequency of this photon matches the resonant frequency of the atom, then this photon might either be used for exciting an atom in the ground state or for stimulated emission from an atom in the excited state. And there are finite probabilities associated with these processes. Another thing to remember is that these excited atoms have the tendency to undergo spontaneous emission and there's a mean lifetime associated with this spontaneous decay. Now since there are probabilities, finite probabilities associated with these processes, we need to compare the rates of these processes in order to understand what is going on inside our lazy medium. And I'm sure all of us are familiar with these rate equations for the three processes that I just mentioned. And we also know how to use these rate equations to come up with an expression for the energy density rho nu under the conditions of thermal equilibrium. And we know how to utilize Planck's law and Boltzmann statistics to come up with a relationship between the Einstein constants. And here are the equations that relate the Einstein constants. Now, for lasing action, that is for light amplification to occur, we want that the number of photons emitted by the atoms in the cavity, which are coherent with the photons going in, must be greater than the number of photons going in. And coherent photons are emitted only by stimulated emission. So we can say that for lasing action, the rate of stimulated emission must be greater than the rate of absorption. And if we substitute the values for these rates from the previous slides, we can say that the necessary condition is that N2 should be greater than N1 for lasing action. And this condition is known as population inversion. But can we achieve population inversion in an atom at thermal equilibrium? Let's look at Boltzmann law once again. As you can see, we can, we can make N2 greater than N1 only if we can make this quantity in this red box smaller than 1. And we can try to reduce the value of this quantity by increasing the temperature. So let's see the effect of increasing the temperature on the ratio of N1 by N2. And from this plot, it is obvious that upon increasing the temperature, the ratio becomes close to 1, but it never becomes smaller than 1. So it's obvious that we cannot achieve population inversion by increasing the temperature of the lasing medium, even if we're talking about temperatures as high as 1000 Kelvin. And hence, we cannot achieve lasing action. So we need another source of energy to try to achieve a population inversion. And this source is called a pump. As we know, Boltzmann statistics apply only under the conditions of thermal equilibrium. So in order to achieve population inversion, we need to break down this thermal equilibrium. And for this, we can use an optical, chemical, or an electrical pump. Or we can even use a laser as a pump. But there's an important thing to remember here. Uh, we know that spontaneous emission competes with stimulated emission to empty the high energy level. So we need stimulated emission to empty this level faster. And this means that we, can, we want to achieve the decay of most of the atoms in the higher energy level by stimulated emission within a time frame which is smaller than, let's say, the mean lifetime of the atom in the excited state. And a good way of doing this is to flood the atom, atoms inside the cavity with a very large number of photons. So let's assume that we can neglect spontaneous emission for some time. And let's also assume that the number of atoms initially in the excited state is zero and in the ground state is 100. So now we use a laser as a pump in this case. And let's say this laser sends 20 photons in a short time interval. Now in reality, only a fraction of these photons will interact with the atoms in the medium. And that fraction can be calculated by using the cross sections for the various types of interactions we talk about, talked about. But let's assume for now that all these photons interact with the atoms in the medium. And we've already proved that the constants for the rates of absorption and simulated emission are equal. So we can say that the ratio of photons involved in absorption to those involved in stimulated emission will be equal to the ratio of the number of atoms in the lower energy level to that in the higher energy level. And although a more realistic approach would be to talk about the ratios of the probabilities of a photon being involved in absorption or stimulated emission, we can use this approach for now if we talk about, let's say, a time average effect. 
So initially, all the 20 photons will be absorbed because there are no photon, uh, because there are no atoms in the excited state. And so in the next step, we'll have 20 atoms in the excited state and 80 atoms in the ground state. Now the next batch of 20 photons will be divided according to the ratio N1 by N2. So four photons will be involved in stimulated emission and 16 in absorption. And so we'll finally have 32 atoms in level E2 and 68 atoms in level E1. Now gradually the atomic population in the level E2 will increase while that in the level E1 will decrease until eventually there are equal number of atoms in both the levels, which in this case is 50. Now at this stage, the next batch of 20 photons will give rise to 10 absorption events and 10 stimulated emission events. And since each stimulated em emission will give us two photons, 20 photons will emerge from the lasing medium in this case. Thus the number of atoms in the two states will not change any further. And the amount of light coming in will become equal to the amount of light leaving the lasing medium. So you can see that basically now our system is behaving as a transparent material. And this condition is known as saturation. So now we can say that it's impossible to achieve population inversion in a two-level system even if we somehow manage to overcome spontaneous emission and break the thermal equilibrium. But is there a way to overcome this impasse? The first breakthrough in this field came in 1960 in the form of a ruby laser. And the ruby laser used a three-level lasing medium. Although three-level lasers are not very efficient, they were the first ones to be created. So let's see how a three-level system works. As you can see, there are three energy levels, E1, E2, and E3. And you already know from Boltzmann law that uh, under conditions of thermal equilibrium, N1 will be greater than N2, which will be greater than N3. An important feature of a three-level system is that the level E2 in the system is a metastable state. Very simply put, it means that the mean lifetime of atoms in this level is very, very large. And this is helpful in lasing action because we can achieve stimulated emission from the atoms in this level much faster than the mean time it takes for spontaneous emission to occur. So what we try to do is that we try to very quickly pump the atoms from level E1 to level E3. And then these atoms decay to the metastable state E2 very quickly by means of non-radiated decay which means that the energy lost by the atom is not emitted as light energy. Instead, it is emitted in the, instead it is released in the form of thermal energy or other forms of energy. An important thing to remember is that never during this process do we get population inversion between levels E1 and E3, and we've already proved why that would be impossible. But since, we're very, but since we are very rapidly pumping atoms to the energy level E2, and the mean lifetime of the atoms in this level is fairly large, we can achieve population inversion between levels E1 and E2. So eventually we'll find that N2 will be greater than N1 and that will be greater than N3. Now, if we leave the system like this for some time, eventually one atom from the level E2 will fall back to the level E1 and emit a photon in the process by means of spontaneous emission. Now this photon will see many other atoms in the lasing medium as it moves through the lasing medium. And these atoms, a lot of these atoms are still in the metastable state. And so this atom will cause the stimulated emission of another photon by interacting with an atom in the metastable state. Now the original photon will continue to move along its path and the emitted photon will be temporarily and spatially coherent with the first photon. So now we have two coherent photons, both of which see many atoms in the metastable state as they move through the medium. And now they interact with two more atoms in the metastable state. And so we get four photons. And now these four, four photons further interact with four atoms to give eight photons, and so on. This entire process occurs in a time span so small that very few atoms in the metastable state get the chance to undergo spontaneous emission. Another important thing is that the photons produced have a frequency mu12 and correspondingly energy h mu12, which is the energy gap between the levels E1 and E2. So it's clear now that we can achieve lasing action using a free level medium. But like I said earlier, this process is not very efficient because in order to keep the ratio N2 to N1 very high, we need to pump the atoms from level E1 to E3 very, very quickly. And a more efficient lasing system, a more efficient lasing medium usually uses four energy levels. A good example of a four energy level 
system is the helium neon laser. As promised, this is a book where you could learn more about absorption, spontaneous emission, and stimulated emission, and about quantum electrodynamics. And that's it for the presentation. Thanks for watching.